So we move to our final uh, presentation, and I'm delighted to introduce Louise Sunderland from uh, the Regulatory Assistance Project to talk about this financing challenge and uh, a new idea that's developing or an idea that's been around that we know needs more uh, publicity. Uh, Louise, over to you. Thank you. I'm probably, I'm probably loud enough, you know. <laughs> uh, and most specifically, revenues from um, the auction of the e EU ETS emissions trading scheme um, allowances. And so these are revenues available to all member states, which is, was the point that was being made by Adrian just there. Um, a slide, please. So we've walked through the exhibition, we've seen the great schemes today, we know the programs are out there, we know the technologies are out there, we've been through this today. We need duplication, expansion, we need adaption. And I think there's a, a significant role in all of this for public funds. Um, I think we need public funds to incentivise, to drive the demand, but also to enable through energy advice, through one-stop shops, through hand-holding. And, and most importantly, very closely to my heart, is we need public funds to fund deep renovation for the energy poor, for those who we would not expect to take on finance um, and certainly couldn't afford to, to fund for themselves. So the revenues from um, the ETS are significant new sources of funding. Um, this is public funds going directly from the auction of allowances into member state budgets. Um, slide, please. And uh, the most up-to-date uh, projections we have been using was that these funds across Europe would amount to 165 billion over the next 10 years. This is a little dated now, this projection. It was uh, 2016, so slide, please. Um, this month, um, later this month, a new projection will come out upping that figure to a lovely round 200 billion. And in fact, that's actually, I think, a probably conservative estimate. Um, WWF will come out with a report later this month. So it's a big sum of money, and importantly, it's, uh, it's um, public funds. Slide, please. We must remember here that the sole aim of the ETS is to save carbon. There is no other reason for it. So by extension, the sole aim of these revenues must be to save carbon. Slide, please. So why am I saying this is largely new money, and it isn't new money, this, a large part of this 200 billion over the next 10 years is new money, which means it should come with new opportunities and additionality. As we know, the new money is largely as a result of the increase in the uh, allowance price in the ETS. It's, it's, uh, uh, the price has rise, risen <laughs> fivefold in the last two years, which is significant. Um, slide, please. And so how is all this new money being spent? Well, this I can only sum summarize as being nothing less, less than a travesty. Only around 50% is spent on carbon purposes. And to be honest, I wouldn't even rely on this figure because the reporting that member states are required to do against how they're spending their revenues is very poor. The actual reporting was poor, but also the reporting requirements are quite poor. So member states are not, for example, required to uh, report the use of the actual revenues. They are required to report equivalent use of the revenue. So they simply write down policies that they had in place anyway, that would the investment in which would add up to the amount of the revenues. This does not mean they are reporting additional effort when they are receiving these windfall sums. So this, I cannot state strongly enough, um, needs to be changed. <laughs> so next slide, please. How should we spend it then? And I'm sure every one of us in this room could come up with some great ideas, on that, and maybe we should play that game after this. But, um, but uh, you know, I have a rationale that I'll present, which is, slide please, um, we should spend this new money where investment is no most needed. No one in this room needs convincing that the building stock is the hardest nut to crack. I would say probably the residential stock is um, the hardest sector within the building stock sector. And this, I could have used a number of illustrations here, but I think this one's quite effective. Shows you this, this shows the, the investment need in the residential sector. You know, and it's, it's quite clear where we need to be spending our money. Um, slide, please. The other 
thing I, need to, I think we need to think about when we think about how we spent the money is how we raise the money. Now, in the ET, ETS, the uh, obligated emitters, so the emitters from the industry sector and the power sector, obviously need to buy their allowances. They pass back the cost of their, those allowances onto us as consumers through um, increases in our energy bills and increased prices of, the, of the, the products we buy. So, consumers are paying for these revenues to be generated. And it's important that the carbon price in the ETS behaves like a consumption tax. And we know that a tax on consumption is, is more regressive than a tax on income as a revenue generator. So this slide here is just showing you the impact of an electricity rate, um, of, of electricity rates on uh, the income deciles. So if you look along the slide here, on the left you have the low income deciles, the, the poorest people in society, and on the right you have the richest pe people in society. The two lines largely tell us the same story, but one is t uh, showing us um, a, a percentage of expenditure, and the other one is tell us, telling us a story about a percentage of income. But the story is here that lo the lowest income people, when we tax consumption or electricity here, the lowest people pay proportionally around four times more. So it is very significant how we're raising these funds, and I think that directs us to think about the use of the revenues for, number one, renovation in buildings, which returns the benefits through long-term bill savings to consumers, but most importantly, that we include large provision for the energy poor, the lower incomes in that, in order to offset, um, more than offset, this regressive impact. Um, slide, please. We need to deliver more carbon for our buck here. We need more carbon bang for our investment buck, I suppose. Um, uh, this is slightly because carbon pricing alone is quite an expensive way of saving carbon, particularly actually in the power sector. Uh, so this study was done for the Commission, it's quite a long time ago now, uh, 2008 I think it was, uh, I can't read that from here, someone tell me if that's 2008, thank you. <laughs> um, and, but, but actually the assumptions that, that were in it are, are still valid. We looked here in this example at a 20 euro price, we're at about a 25 euro price. So, so you know, we're not, we're, it's still a re very relevant figure. And this told us that for, for a, at a 20 euro price of carbon um, in, in the ETS, um, the cost of a tonne abated of carbon would be 248 euros. That's a large cost to the consumer for a tonne abated. Um, and there's a very complicated and long story about how those figures come out, which I'd be delighted to tell you all after this, but um, it's a whole presentation in itself. Over a drink. Over a drink, yeah. <laughs> like you want to do that over a drink. <laughs> uh, next slide, please. So, we need to get more carbon for our investment buck. How do we do that? Energy efficiency. So this study showed that when we take the revenue and invest it in an effective energy efficiency program, we can generate seven to nine times more carbon than the price alone. So this study looked at a very small 3% levy rate rise in, in electricity bills. This was actually the energy efficiency obligation in the UK that was modeled here. And you can see the 3% rate rise, the price signal, produces this small little blue um, wedge along the bottom. So we do get a little bit of carbon saving here. But then when you take the revenue created by that 3% rate rise and you invest it in the energy efficiency obligation in the UK as was, it was actually a very effective pro program before it was uh, stripped, um, it produced this huge wedge, this huge wed red wedge of energy savings, seven to nine times more for the same investment. So why wouldn't you? Um, next slide, please. So that's the rationale. Um, it, it works on paper. Does it work in practice? Well, of course it does. Um, slide, please. And there are some great examples out there um, of countries who are devoting large proportions, up to 100% of their revenues, into renovation programs. Um, and, and there are three here that I'm sure we'll all be familiar with. We should just say here, though, that I looked into this issue of how member states were using their revenues back in 2013, so six years ago, and these are the same examples I found then. There hasn't been much change. So I think Adrian was absolutely right in the introduction, which is that we need to be talking much more around this. I think in the last six years, these revenues have been rising, have been you know, absorbed into member states' treasuries, and, and the investment, in, particularly in renovation schemes, is not increasing. Uh, slide, please. I'd just like to focus on the um, the last uh, slide, please. 
Thank you. The, uh, the last programme shown there, which is the Czech Republic's new green savings programme. Now, they've been investing um, carbon revenues, so originally from Kyoto and now from the ETS, in uh, a building renovation programme for, for 10 years. So that's a long experience they've got. Um, so a few words around the scheme. Um, you know, it, it subsidises a full range of measures. It incentivises households to go to deeper renovation rates with a higher level of subsidy. Um, it's been effective at driving some a large proportion of thermal renovation measures, which, as we know, are some of the more difficult. Um, slide, please. The evaluation shows, interestingly, actually, I, I read an evaluation this year of, of the new green saving program in the context of the other Czech Republic uh, national um, energy efficiency programs, and it found that it, it had achieved the largest savings of any program which is significant, and also it was one of the most two or three cost-effective saving programs across all sectors. Bear in mind this is largely a residential sector program, and we know the residential sector is difficult and the barriers are high. You know, I think that's really a significant in, um, a finding. The boxes along the bottom here show a little bit about how much has been invested over time, um, 350 million in the period 2014 to 18. You can see the investment in the final year, 2018, is, is very significantly higher. So it is ramping up, part as a, to do, as to do, uh, as a result of changes to the program to increase demand, uh, as has previously been said, to make it easier for applications, to make it more attractive. But I think the last point I want to dwell on um, here is, is, is the leverage rate achieved in this program. And this, for me, is the real kind of important cornerstone of, of the power of public money, is that it leverages other money. And in the Czech program, actually, they have a relatively conservative leverage rate, rate which is for every euro subsidy provided, household investment meets that with a, with a further three euros. Um, slide, please. So if you, Anna, again, please. So if you look at then the future potential of the Czech Republic's uh, revenues, which are projected to be anywhere between four and seven billion uh, over the next 10 years, slide please. Um, and then you apply the relatively conservative leverage rate that they've achieved to date, please. Um, you achieve an investment that is at least equal to the investment need outlined in the national renovation strategy for the residential sector. If you take the higher, the seven billion, the higher estimate of the revenues, you'll, you'll, and apply the re leverage rate, you're not far off the whole investment need for the next decade in the whole building stock. So this is just an illustration of the potential of these revenues if we, if we really dedicate some political will to investing them. Now this, I should caveat, would require 100% of the revenues all dedicated to this one program, but you know we've seen from other countries that that is possible. So, um, slide please. The one point, and this was all, almost planned, it wasn't actually planned, but this, this is the slide I want to leave on, which is that in looking in some of, the, uh, some of these examples, um, particularly the Czech Republic scheme and the KFW scheme, they have budgets being allocated to them uh, in, in a politically you know, very courageous way, but actually they're starting to build up reserves. So within the KFW scheme, we currently have 4.5 billion allocated but unspent funds which is amazing, it's colossal. And I think this is exactly the point that's been made a couple of times here today, is that you know, we have the programs, we know that. We do need the funding of finance, but alongside that, we need the demand. We need, we need ambitious, courageous, I like Adrian's word, courageous European and member state level policies that drive a long-term trajectory, a knowable trajectory of demand that then investment can be uh, uh, orchestrated alongside and that the programs can then uh, ramp up, scale up in order to deliver against. And then we will be on our 2050 building stock trajectory.